Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Conversations in History. My name is Laura Matacoro. I hope everyone can hear me okay. I will uh, trust that there'll be some active um, gesturing from my co-participants, co if that's not the case. Um, I'm delighted to, to play host today to our first um, session of Conversations in History, which is hosted by the Department of History at Carleton University. I have the pleasure of being an associate professor here, um, and also uh, I have the great pleasure of hosting this first conversation. I do want to take a moment to acknowledge that I'm uh, speaking to you today from my office at Carleton, and so I'm speaking uh, from the traditional territory of the Algonquin Nation, a uh, territory that is unceded and unsurrendered, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity uh, to live here and work here. Um, I have, uh, I'm waiting for my co-participants, co uh, our two great authors who are going to be, there they are, uh, who are going to be in conversation today. Uh, we're featuring Amy Tector and Jamie Liu, um, both of whom have debut novels uh, coming out this spring. Amy's is coming out this month at the end of March, and Jamie's will be out at the end of April. And so this seemed like a very timely uh, moment to have, to have a conversation. Uh, the world is a pretty grim place right now, and so being able to take some time and celebrate the works of authors that um, that bring us insights and joy and really just make the world a better place is, is a wonderful thing to do. So thank you for joining us on this Friday afternoon. I'm going to do a couple of housekeeping um, things and then we'll uh, do a proper introduction of both our authors. And we'll start off with a reading and then we'll have a Q&A. I just wanted to mention that the session is being recorded um, so that it can be shared with those family, friends and colleagues who couldn't be here today. Uh, the other thing is because this is a webinar, um, the format is slightly different in that the chat is inaccessible, but we are hoping that you'll ask many questions uh, and that our authors will have many answers. And so please feel free, feel free to use the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your screen uh, to ask any questions uh, that come to mind. Um, I think of both of these authors as very candid, forthright people, and so I'm sure no question is, is too daunting for these two. And so on that note, uh, I will do, I will get right to the task at hand, which is to introduce uh, our two authors. And as I mentioned, the format um, is to have both authors read for about 10 minutes from each of their works and introduce the larger context of the novels that they've been uh, working on and that are soon gonna be in the world. And then we'll have time for lots of Q and A. So we have about an hour together today, which is lovely. Uh, and so it's my, well, we'll start off in the order of uh, presentation. So we'll start with Amy Tector. Um, and I'm just gonna read the bios that uh, the two authors have provided. Although I am tempted to freestyle, but I won't, I'm restraining myself. Uh, but I'll just say that I hold both Amy and Jamie in, in great, great high esteem, great regard, and I'm so thrilled that you're here today. So Amy spent more than 20 years plumbing the secret squirreled away in archives. She works at Library and Archives Canada and is adjunct professor at the University of Ottawa and a sessional instructor here at Carleton. Uh, Amy's debut novel, which we're celebrating today, The Honeybee Emeralds, uh, is weeks away from being out in the world. And then her second novel, titled The Foulest Things, um, is a first in a trilogy uh, centered on murders and mayhem in the archives. And that's actually going to come out later this fall. So hopefully we can have you back for another uh, conversation in history. Um, Amy also lives here in Ottawa um, with Violet and her husband, and her, bio, her daughter, Violet, I should explain thoroughly, uh, her husband, Andrew, and a dog named Daffodil, who may or may not appear in the book. I can't quite remember. No. Uh, and I'm, she makes a reference in her bio to her cross-country skiing skills, but I think we could just ask her about that at the end. So, Amy, thank you so much for being here. And I'll just introduce Jamie as well, and then we'll get you to, uh, to start us off. So, Jamie Chayun Lu is the author of Dandelion, uh, which won the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop, the Jim, Chung, Jim Wong Chu Emerging Writers Award last year, two years ago now. I've lost track of time, but congratulations. Uh, and Dandelion is coming out, as I say, at the end of April. Uh, Jamie is a lawyer, law professor, and podcaster specializing in immigration, refugee, and citizenship law. 
and she is uh, based across the across the city at the University of Ottawa. Uh, and thank you for being here today, Jamie. Um, so without further ado, uh, Amy, do you want to start us off by telling us a bit about your book and, and reading a little bit from uh, the Honeybee Emeralds? Thank you so much, Laura, for organizing this and for the history department for hosting uh, and for Jamie for uh, <laughs> joining as well and, um, and Alex for all of your uh, technical help. Um, yeah, so I'm super excited to be talking about my book today. Um, the Honeybee Emeralds is a lighthearted mystery set in expat Paris. Um, and um, I, I think I'll just dive into the reading just to let you know it's a little bit under 10 minutes. I always like to know how long these readings are gonna go for. So it'll only be 10 minutes. Um, and I'm starting from near the beginning of the book. Um, but just to give you a little bit of background, it's gonna feature uh, one of the four protagonists uh, in the story, Alice. And um, we're gonna pick up her story as she's stumbling around in this very large basement of a building in Paris, a huge, complicated, convoluted, basement with lots of different hallways going off in different directions. She went down there with her neighbor who she had just met, Alexander. The lights went out and Alice got terribly lost. And so now she's wandering around in the basement and um, has come across a door. Dun, dun, dun. So uh, I'll, I'll begin. There was a door behind the rack. Without thinking, she pushed it open. She entered the room and the small beam of light picked up sequins. As she moved deeper into the space, the light fell on feathers, silks, and shimmering patterns of embroidery. She flashed the light higher. Racks of clothing crammed with bright, colorful dresses, polka-dotted, striped, and patterned with flowers. Her heart beat faster. She followed the wall across to the far side of the room, where she found a little stool on wheels and a table covered in sewing supplies. Needles, thread, safety pins, and an enormous pair of silver scissors. As her heart rate slowed, she realized that somehow, despite the dank cold, she was covered in a thin film of sweat that chilled her body. She shivered. A sudden hum raised the hairs on the back of her neck. Then the room filled with brightness. She laughed in relief. The lights were back on and she could finally see. Now the glory of the racks of clothes was revealed. Three rows of lavish and sequined finery. Some were party dresses with fluffy chiffon underskirts, giving them a full bodied look as if awaiting a dance partner. There were gorgeous heavy velvet gowns in deep rich colors that looked like something Eleanor of Aquitaine would wear. A few leather jackets, a section devoted to bejeweled brassieres, golden sheaths, floor length ball gowns. It was an Aladdin's cave of vintage clothes. The jumble and brightness and verve of the room made her smile. A thick layer of dust covered everything and spiders and moths had been busy. She was no fashion expert, but despite the damage, these clothes seemed expensive and well-made. At the back of the room was another surprise, a dozen wigs, each one sitting on a beautiful wooden stand. She rubbed her hands together, partly in delight, partly to warm them up. She walked up the far aisle, occasionally pulling something out from the racks that caught her eye. Her hands brushed against a soft sleeve. She tugged the garment out. It was different from most of the items. Rather than a satin gown or feathered headdress, it was more of an everyday jacket, but a beautiful opulent green velvet. Hand embroidered flowers and fruits were stitched over the pockets and there were intricate brass buttons on the sleeves with tiny matching ones adorning the front. It was like something Mr. Toad would wear for afternoon tea. Couldn't she borrow it to warm up? She shrugged her shoulders into the coat it was long in the arms, but cinched in perfectly at her waist. It was heavy and cozy. She wiped the dust from the shoulders and wished for a mirror to see what she looked like. A moment later, she heard a voice calling her name, Alexander. She went to the door and shouted for him. Alice, his voice was distant. She was oddly flattered he remembered her name. Here, she shouted back. Stay there, he yelled. There was silence for about 20 seconds, and then he called her name again. He was closer this time and she poked her head out in the hall. Alexander, I'm here, she shouted. He rounded the corner and she felt only relief at the sight of him coming toward her. The lights came back on, she said inanely. 
Yes, I fixed them, he said, looking through the doorway at the gowns, the wigs, the feathers. She had the impression that his brain was filing every detail away. How, she exclaimed, found the fuse box and replaced the burned out one. The lights are on an old system, temperamental. His tone was disinterested as he continued to absorb the costumes. How did you find the fuse box in the dark, she asked. It was there next to the boiler when the lights went out, he said. The boiler was right there. She recalled seeing a large shape in the corner of the room before it went dark. I freaked out. Yes, he agreed. There was no sympathy in his tone. What is this place, he asked. His voice held a hint of wonder and she felt a quick jolt of connection with him. I don't know, it's a wardrobe room or something. She looked around again, feeling the same wave of excitement. It was like the inside of, Won of the Wonka chocolate factory, filled with overwhelming bounty, dazzling treasures, unique abundance. It felt magical and oddly like it all belonged to her. Wardrobe? You know, a place where a theater company would keep its clothes. As she said the words, she realized that was exactly what this was. The clothes, apart from the jacket, were far too extravagant to be anything but stage costumes. Alexander nodded. There was once a theater in the building. It closed down many years ago. You mean all of this is abandoned? Alice hugged the jacket closer. Maybe she could keep it. Alexander shrugged. I guess so, he sniffed. It smells forgotten. He was right. There was an odor, damp, mildew, age, neglect. How mad? Do you think it's been sitting here for years? No one claimed it? No one found it? How is that possible? You got very lost. We are quite far from the main hallway. Perhaps they forgot about it. We should find the owners. It would make a great story for the magazine. Maybe so, he said, turning to go. Now we must fix the furnace. With a last lingering look at the treasures, they exited. They walked a couple of steps and Alexander stopped, surprised her by stopping. Wardrobe, that is an uncommon word, like the book with the lion and the children. The lion, the witch and the wardrobe, Alice said. They go through a cupboard and fall into Narnia. I loved that story. Alexander nodded. Yes, it was a good one. They walked a few steps further, turning a quick right into a much wider corridor. The light stretched down the hall as far as the eye could see. About 10 feet further along, a hallway split off to the left and then to the right. Alice was again disoriented. How do you know where we're going? I remember from when I fixed my heat last time, he said. His deep voice was reassuring her that if they came across malevolent basement creatures, it might be useful to have a large man by her side. Alice wondered how big Alexander's breakfasts must be. It had to involve a lot of eggs, maybe a whole dozen. The thought brought to mind her beloved Mr. Men series, some of the first books she had read upon arriving in England. A caseworker had handed her and her mother an asylum seeker welcome packet, toothbrushes, change of clothes, bars of soap, and there at the bottom, five little square books. She'd studied enough English in school to read their simple words. She remembered marveling at how many eggs Mr. Strong consumed. The illustration was, a whole, was of a whole plate of them heaped in great bounty. Mr. Strong's red arms stretched wide with joy and his little yellow tongue stuck out at the side. Eggs, 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 he exclaimed. There was something calming about seeing all of that abundance safely before him. Young Alice understood that feeling of relief. She and her mother were safe. They had left Iran behind. They could stop moving. The pinched look would leave her mother's face. They belonged now. Eggs, eggs, eggs. Alexander had slowed, pondering a left-hand turn down a narrower hallway. Alice nearly banged into him. His clothes retained that faint smell of honeysuckle she had caught when she had knocked on his door. If the lights went out again, she could still find him in the dark, trace him by that scent. In A Midsummer Night's Dream, Shakespeare had called honeysuckle luscious woodbine. There was something rich about the smell, wanton, she blushed. Their feet echoed down the hall in the silence. How can the boiler be so far from our office, she asked. Very inefficient, Alexander grunted disapprovingly, and Alice stifled the urge to apologize, as if the poorly designed heating system was her fault. They walked on, passing an arched door made of wooden planks with huge black hinges. It was closed, but Alice could imagine Bilbo Baggins behind it, fussily brewing up a pot of tea and a second breakfast. They walked on, and the silence was unbearable. Where are you from, she asked. No answer. 
For a moment, she wondered if he had decided to ignore her. At last, he spoke. Iceland. Really? She exclaimed. Yes, he said. Does that surprise you? It's just I haven't met anyone from Iceland before. That definitely explained his Viking vibe. Well, today is full of discoveries for you, he said. She couldn't understand why she was pleased about his snarky rejoinder until she realized he hadn't returned her question and asked where she was from. As a Persian woman growing up in the UK, that had been a standard question and had only intensified since she'd arrived in Paris. They turned at last into a spacious room. She could see a huge metal machine like something from the industrial revolution hulking in the corner. This must be the boiler. Alexander's head was already buried deep within the furnace's mechanisms, giving her an unobstructed view of his tree trunk legs and the faintest hint of a bum crack. Still chilly, she thrust her hands deep into the jacket pockets. Her fingers brushed against something cool and hard. Gently, she pulled it out and gasped. Alexander turned toward her. She held the thing up to the light. It was a diamond necklace with a large golden bee pendant in its center and an enormous emerald shining from each wing. Alexander's eyes widened. Faluga, he breathed, beautiful. She dangled it by the diamond chain, letting the pendant glint and sparkle in the dim light. In a flash, she understood why she had wound up in the basement this morning, why she had stumbled upon the wardrobe room and pulled on the jacket. She was meant to find this necklace, this treasure. It was her destiny. I, sorry, I didn't do the accents, but that <laughs> is far beyond me. <laughs> that was amazing. Thank you so much, Amy. It's, uh, it's extraordinary how much uh, material you were able to cover in, in 10 minutes. And you took us through this winding, winding labyrinth of a basement. And, and there was all kinds of language and references. I was making notes. I think that phrase, malevolent basement creatures is going to stay with me for, for some time. So thank you for that uh, really evocative reading. And I'm sure we all have lots of questions about the larger story and the inspiration and how much of it is based on real life, all those good things. So um, I, should, I will uh, remind everyone that if you do, if a question or comment comes to mind, please feel free to use the Q&A uh, box and we will of course have a more open discussion at the end of the readings. Um, and now we'll turn it over to, to Jamie and get a little bit of a glimpse of Dandelion. Uh, Jamie, if you want to set up the, the reading for us and uh, over to you. Thanks. I just want to say, Amy, I really loved your description of the coat and the jewelry. It was I, I could see a version of it in my own head, so it was wonderful to listen to. I just want to thank Laura and Alex and, of course, the history department at Carleton for this kind invitation. Um, it's really nice to celebrate something amidst um, the chaos that's in the world today. Um, and I also just want to acknowledge that I am reading from the unceded, unsurrendered um, territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. Um, as Laura kindly introduced, um, my novel is titled Dandelion, and it is a story about a woman named Lily who becomes a new mother and on the birth of her new baby, she starts to think about the disappearance of her mother when she was 11 years old. She rewinds her life to her childhood to try to understand what happened. And it leads her on a journey to uncover the mystery of the disappearance of her mother. So I'm reading from early on in the book and um, it sets up the, um, where Lily comes from. My father's older sister, Auntie Chunyu, placed chicken satay sticks on the backyard barbecue. She shot a dirty look at mother. Auntie complained that mother didn't cook the way father liked and often referred to her as father's light-skinned child bride. She told mother to stop playing and start cooking. Mother rolled her eyes behind auntie's back. My little sister B and I laughed with her. Auntie Chunu came over every weekend to cook dinner. It stung auntie that we lived in the Heights she and Uncle Stephen had bought a small bungalow near downtown Sparwood, a more modest house then, ours given that there was just the two of them. She visited weekly, hoping her presence in Sparwood Heights would elevate her status. I asked mother why Auntie needed more stature when she was already tall with broad, sturdy shoulders. Mother replied that status was more than just physical, that Auntie wanted to appear rich, powerful, and all-knowing. Whenever she came, Auntie Chunyu proudly wore her kabaya nanya, 
a brightly colored fitted embroidered blouse paired with a batik sarong. I hopped off the swing and ran over to Auntie Chunyu. Although she picked on mother, she was my elder and one of the few people I had known my entire life. The oldest of father's siblings, she loved to lecture, correct and order mother around, but not me. Auntie would let me have her, but she kept a careful distance. If I inched too close to rest my hand on her or to hug her, she would pull away as if she was afraid to catch something. The turmeric in the marinade must have brought Auntie some warmth that spring day in 1987, as she taught me how to make satay. As she was preparing the sauce that accompanies the skewers, she told me the secret to this recipe is to allow the nutty spices to make space for one another. She permitted me to dip my fingers into the dark, dark rich sauce to savor the flavors dancing in my mouth. Lily, mother bellowed, stop sticking your fingers in the bowl. She was sitting at the picnic table, rubbing her ankle, tracing her fingers around the bones on both sides of her foot. She told me she had injured it as a teenager in a bicycle accident, and it was never the same after that. Ayo, sweetheart, Auntie Chunyu scolded. No need to yell at Lily. She's learning how to make satay from the best. Mother's eyebrows furrowed and her eyes narrowed like a cat watching its prey. Then as though retreating on soft paws, mother dutifully set the table. Auntie Chunyu reminded mother to set an extra space at the table for those who could not join. My cousin, her son Winston, was the only missing guest, the only person who defied Auntie Chunyu. He chose not to come to Canada despite her efforts. And now she talked of Winston as if he were dead. I heard mother describe Auntie Chunyu's eulogies as if she was kaupe kaubu, crying about dead parents. Auntie talked about Winston as we ate dinner. Jin Hao say, so young and yet a life already wasted. Uncle Stephen sighed, Gao Yao, enough already. You give up on your only son so easily, Auntie growled back. If you were a good father, he would be here. He would not be stateless. He would be Canadian. Chu Niu, mother said. He's got permanent residence in Brunei. He's not without status. You should be proud of him. He started his own business. He's building his future. He's not living in a longhouse with the Iban. Auntie Chunyu scoffed, surprised that my mother would dare challenge her. He might as well be with the orangutans and the temburong on the Brunei River. How can you think that he has a future when he is nobody? His car dealership is like that plastic bag floating in the wind. It's flying high now towards the clouds, but once it falls, it will be treated like the garbage it really is. Chunyu, at least you know we're safe in Canada, Uncle Stephen reminded. Thanks to Aloy's foresight to sponsor all of us, we're not without status. Auntie Chunyu turned to father. Yes, Aloy is a dutiful brother, but what good is it for us to be here when my son is languishing back home? It's never too late, father said. You should continue to talk to Winston, put some sense in him. Mother laughed bitterly. Time will tell if there's any sense in moving here. Why would Winston do that? Work in the mine with you and Steven? He's running his own business back home, driving a nice car, living a nice house, being cleaned by an ama. His own boss, he's his own boss and he's youth on his side. That's more than I can say for the two of you. Father shifted in his seat, set down his satay and pushed his plate towards the center of the table. You envy Winston, Suiha, he said, but his life is a house of cards. He relies on a Malay to even have his business. His name is not even on the ownership papers. Everything he has built can be taken away just like that. One day a storm will come and everything will tumble down. No amount of money can help him crawl out from under the rubble and rebuild. If I were Winston, I would ask, why would I put my life and that of my children's at risk? Father wiped his mouth with his napkin and continued, we are nothing to those in power. They don't recognize you. They don't look at you. They can discard you and kick you out. Winston, like all of us stateless people, are expendable. And I don't want to wait for the day when my life and the lives of my children come crashing down. I'm sorry, Trinu, but you do have reason to worry. If I were his father, I would drag him out of that jungle and bring him here. B grabbed the last satay stick and placed it on her plate, pausing to see if I would protest. I didn't. Mother chimed in again. Here, yes, you have papers, but nothing, nothing else. We live in a valley far away from the city and you work underground. Our children are separated from so much family. The other day, I heard Beatrice tell someone she doesn't know Chinese because she doesn't need it. The air can freeze you to death. The food is flavorless. Think about the Assam fish head soup back home, the fresh galangal. 
lemongrass, the green everywhere, the mangoes growing in our backyard. Think about the pungent smell of durian. Even Auntie Chunyu nodded slightly and murmured. I can see why Winston chose to stay where he is, mother said. Let me ask all of you, what is holding us back? We have citizenship now, we can go back home. Home, father harumphed. How can you call that place home? Why would I leave a place that has welcomed me and my children to go back to a place that looked at us like we were shit floating down the river from the stilt houses of Kampong Ayer? You can't even have a beer without a state taking that away from you too. Who wants to live in a dry state? We can drink all the tetarik and eat all the chendol in the world, Auntie added, but Aloy is right. We would always hunger for more. The, the joy the food brings to our lives would be a distraction from the worry that we would be kicked out or denied something one day. Even the heat is tiring there. Then we can come back to Canada, said mother. I don't want the yo-yo life, retorted Auntie. It's not right. We can't go back, father said. We chose this place and it chose us. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jamie. It's too bad in some senses that we're doing the webinar because we can't do our, our applause or you know, any of the emojis, but that was uh, an incredible glimpse into, uh, into Dandelion, the story. And um, already I find myself thinking about family and place and home. And so thank you for that really wonderful uh, and transporting reading. Um, so we have lots, we have about half an hour for, for questions. And I don't know if Amy and Jamie have questions for each other, but I have a question that I thought I would uh, indulge my host prerogative and start us off with. Um, because I know from chatting with both of you and, and some people maybe had a chance to listen to our pre-recorded conversation where we talked about the inspiration uh, for the honeybee emeralds and dandelion. Uh, but listening to you read, I was also thinking about how these, the, both these novels have quite the story behind them, both in terms of your own personal trajectories and then how the novels came into being. And so I wondered if you could share with us some of the, the story behind the, the creating and the making of The Honeybee Emeralds and Dandelion. Sure, I, I, I can start. And I just wanted to, this is the first time I've heard uh, Jamie's uh, story. So I, I love that. I love that care, that ant character, Jamie. Uh, <laughs> sounds like a very well-drawn, strong, interesting character. Um, the, the Honeybee Emeralds came out of um, an interest that I have in, I, I've always had in writing. Uh, so ever since I was little, I was um, reading, reading, reading and uh, writing stories. Um, and so it's actually the, I think, fourth novel that I have written, um, but the first that I've uh, managed to get published. Um, and uh, really the inspiration came because I wanted to write something fun. I was, I was it was, it was pre-pandemic. I wrote it before the pandemic, probably in about 2018, 2017, 2018. Um, and, um, uh, I just I wanted to write something lighthearted, and, but I wanted it to have a, I wanted there to be a mystery element. And the three previous novels I had written were all set in Canada, uh, and I hadn't managed to sell them because the other thing I wanted to do was actually get a book published. Um, and so I thought, well, maybe I'll set this one not in Canada. I love my country, but maybe you know I, I will have more um, more appeal if it was set elsewhere. So. I then cast around to where I would like to set a book. And I'm quite lazy, so I don't want to do massive amounts of research. So I thought it needs to be somewhere I, I know quite well. Um, I lived in Brussels for a few years and I thought I could set it in Brussels, but Brussels is kind of the Canada of Europe. So <laughs> it's the Ottawa of Europe. So uh, I thought, well, that's, that's actually not super glamorous, but Paris, everybody loves books about Paris. So it was a very pragmatic decision to set my book in Paris. Um, and in fact, I don't even have any Canadian characters, which was actually, I shouldn't be admitting this, but it was a deliberate decision, like a sort of mercenary decision on my part to see if I could, could write something that was a bit more saleable. So I have Icelandic characters and French characters and American characters and British characters and Iranian British characters, but no actual Canadians. Um, but yeah, so the, so I wanted to write a mystery. I wanted to set it in Paris uh, and sort of and have it be fun and have it have there be lots of discussion of 
you know, clothes and food and weather and history and all those sort of interesting things that exist in that kind of a setting. Uh, so that's what I set out to do. I wanted to write the mystery part, but I didn't want to have to do, um, I didn't want to have to uh, research again, lazy. I didn't want to have to do a lot of research into uh, French uh, policing rules and laws because it, it can be, they can be quite tricky to figure out how, you know, what the levels are. So it couldn't be, it couldn't be a crime that involved the police. And so that's how I settled on this idea of a beautiful lost necklace. And so the, the mystery resides in the history of that necklace and the four protagonists are trying to go back and do research, the historical research to figure out who owned that necklace. And so over the course of their research, they discover that it was owned by Napoleon III, one of Napoleon III's mistresses, uh, Mata Hari, who's the, the famous First World War spy, and then uh, Josephine Baker, who's the, of course this amazing jazz age singer. Um, and so that ended up being the mystery was uncovering these women's lives. They're all, they're all real world people. Um, and of course the joke was on me because I had to do massive amounts of research in order to <laughs> tell those people's stories, but it was super interesting, wonderful research that I was really into. So uh, it, I didn't have to learn about French policing rules, but, uh, and I got to learn about Josephine Baker and Matahari and, and tell their stories or tell my version of their stories. So that's the genesis. That's it's um, it would it's striking how much research. I mean, it's obvious in the book how much research was involved. Um, and I know that the the three historical women were were real women. Was were the honeybee emeralds? Are they a real thing? No, but um, and this is, so it's so it's based on uh, more research. I had to also learn about diamonds and emeralds, which I don't know a single thing about. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so I did a ton of research on that, and th that kind of jewelry existed in the time period where it was made. And there's one particular jeweler that I based. Now I I can't actually remember its name, but there is a real jeweler that has a sort of 400 year pedigree of existing in Paris in the spot where I put the jeweler in the book, um, and it has uh, it's got a very elaborate name. I, anyway, um, and uh, so it's so the so the jeweler it's it could exist and that kind of, you know, elaborate designed jewelry. They had peacocks and all sorts of other uh, interesting animal jewelry that's, that's still around and Marie Antoinette wore that jewelry. So it's, so the, so the, that concept is there, but um, that honeybee emeralds itself never existed. I think it's a sign of what good research can do. You can conjure up these, these beautiful pieces. I, I do have a question about research later. Um, and I will say, just a reminder to everyone, if you do want to ask questions, otherwise I will, I will dominate. I have so many questions for both of you because these works are so amazing. And I know that you do so much uh, in addition to, to writing. But Jamie, let's hear from, from you. Do you want to tell us a little bit about um, how Dandelion came, in, came into the world? Thank you. Um, just listening to Amy, um, uh, my first draft of this novel is written in 2018 as well. Um, I'm an academic and it was uh, during the year of my first sabbatical and I was privileged enough to have some time to do this, but it really was born out of an, a, a desire to have a different outlet to explore the things that I was already researching and working on. Um, my Bread and butter is researching on immigration and refugee law, but my work recently has turned to the issue of statelessness and in particular, why people don't have citizenship. Um, I study that both in Canada and in Southeast Asia. And in 2018, um, my field work took me to Malaysia in particular, uh, where a part of the book takes place. So um, yeah, I, I think in the course of researching and talking and interviewing, I was doing a lot of field work and interviewing stateless persons, their families and advocates. And it, you know, in the course of listening to their stories, I began to um, see a common theme in the ways in which they saw themselves and the ways in which they felt their existence um, in the ways in which they felt they belonged. And and similarly, I talked to a lot of people who were stateless and who had acquired citizenship and how that impacted them and how that label and that construction of statelessness never goes away and how that informs the way people identify themselves or walk through the world. And I couldn't really find a good way of writing about this academically 
in the ways that I wanted to. So I do talk about it in my academic work, but I feel I felt quite confined in it. And so, you know, creative writing is a very freeing, liberating experience for me, at least. I found it to be um, an absolutely refreshing outlet. And, um, and it was nice to enjoy some of the themes and thinking that I was going through at the time and reflecting on the work and the conversations I had with people. So, yeah, it, there was a lot of research involved in this, but I have to say it wasn't research for this book in particular, but for other reasons. And it was kind of nice to be able to pull the research and in some ways disseminate it in a very different way. So yeah, I feel very lucky that this, this a confluence of events led me here. I think you both hinted a little bit at the interplay between, you know, your professional work, but this is also professional work. But so you're doing many, many things. And I, I keep saying, I will ask you, like with if and when you sleep, but I'm not going to do that. But I just I do have this question, like, how do you do so much? Um, and I, I know there are some questions in the Q&A, but I just wanted to ask one question uh, because it was partly what inspired this conversations in history was thinking about how research can be used in so many different ways. And you've both sort of spoken to, to the fact that, well, Amy, you were trying to avoid research and then research found you. And Jamie, you were in the thick of research and, and looking for an outlet. Um, but I, I'm wondering just, just sort of that interplay between having an idea and doing research sometimes the research takes us in really different directions than we might have expected and so i'm wondering if that was the case for you uh writing as you were working on these two projects and if yes if you could share with us you know maybe where where your ideas took a different direction because of the research you were doing i think it's something that historians often um you know are sort of we're sort of very humble when it comes to the archives and to research. And so I'd be curious to have your thoughts on that. I don't know, Amy, do you want to go first? We'll give Jamie a break. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, of course. I mean, I think anybody who's done any, even the smallest amount of research knows it, it, it goes all over the place and you have to just follow. So um, I'm just trying to think of any, I don't think there was any specifics. I I sort of decided on who my three female historical figures were going to be by doing lots of reading around the around the time period and figuring it out. Josephine Baker and Mata Hari are fairly well known figures, so I I knew about them. But the but uh, Marguerite Belanger, who is the the miss that mistress, one of Napoleon the Third's many 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 mistresses. <laughs> But she was a she was working class and she was born dirt poor and you know was a circus performer and ended up landing sort of essentially the the at the top of the heap as the mistress of the most powerful man in Europe at the time um, and and then and then had a happy ending where she you know got dumped by him but was set up for life and and lived this wonderfully fulfilling life in my opinion um and so she was really I had no idea where that that research was going to take me but it was all so fascinating like I you she seems like a fictional character and that story arc it seems like a fictional story but but in fact it's true so it's it's so rewarding to then be able to to, to follow that and I mean Mata Hari as well we all think of her as if we if we're familiar with her story, we think of her as this, you know, uh, seductress and this, this possibly treasonous woman who betrayed France in the First World War. But in fact, her story is completely tragic. She was in a very abusive relationship with her husband in, and, and, and essentially became Mata Hari as we know her because she needed money to um, regain custody of her child who her 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 husband had taken from her so and then Josephine Baker is like there is so much about her I mean she owned a cheetah she she, she had affairs with like Frida Kahlo and and Charles de Gaulle like she lived a life so I mean it was such rich material um it was almost that was almost overwhelming in terms of research I had to limit myself and then what does what it has happened because all of the books I've written have had a historical element because I have that interest and I work at the archives. Um, and what I've always found in all of these instances is you then have to 
resist the urge to cram it all in and into your novel. You want to sort of show all this cool stuff you found and you have to you have to really pull back. Um, and it's, it can be really hard because there's so many cool things you want to tell people about that, that, but if it doesn't fit the story, you have to pull it back. So it's, it is that sort of judicious, the research took me in all sorts of different places, like you said, Laura, and, and then I had to rein it in and choose what best served the story and uh, do a lot of cutting. Uh, it's exciting to hear about, I'm getting, I'm, I'm like enthralled by your, by your journey. And I have to say too, that, uh, and some, uh, you know, at some points in, in the book, I was like, I have to Google this because I don't know enough about, you know, so with Josephine Baker's banana skirt, I was like, what does that look like? And so the joy of Google as you read is you can follow some of the research you were doing. Um, yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Jamie, do you want to tell us about uh, uh, your research or twists and turns in the, in the making of Dandelion? Yeah, um, you know, similar to Amy in that sometimes you just never know where things take you. And um, you know, primarily I'm a legal scholar, so I was, you know, initially very focused on, oh, what are the legal barriers that stateless persons face in courtrooms, in registrars, you know, in the paperwork that they have to do. And, you know, when you start to talk to people about their own experiences, they tell you far more than just that, right? So um, it really was um, interesting to see how my work academically started to move outside the legal to the more sociological, socio-legal stuff. And then it that led me to, as I said, writing this creative writing piece. But then in the, in the course of the creative writing piece, it started generating questions for me about, well, why is it that these people are, um, you know, aside from the legal barriers, like what is the actual cause of this? It's, you know, people, um, in the statelessness world often talk about it just simply as a legal problem that once the laws are tweaked, it will be fine. And it actually really triggered different questions for me to ask in my research so much so that I went back to my academic work and re reformulated the questions and actually took me on a more historical route in terms of talking about the effects of uh, colonization and the colonizing legal language in um, Constant in, in post British colonies and the and the language that they use to hierarchically create citizenship, and this is common not only in Canada and in Malaysia, but in a whole, I would say many um, former British colonies. And so it's kind of taken me on a different research trajectory. You know, going through this from, you know, a legal academic stance, going into a creative writing stance, and then all the questions that I had there redefining the work that I do now. So I do have to say that it has been a lot of twists and turns, but very rewarding ones. And, and, and it's really nice to see how they're generative um, processes that they both feed into each other. So yeah, it, it surprised me as well. So it's, it's nice to see that kind of work work together and symbiotically. Yeah, I mean, it both sounds like you uh, like you both have this sort of bounty of riches, right, Jamie? You're moving back and forth between your academic work and and the the fiction writing, and and even some of your phrasing. I think I don't often uh, associate with legal scholars the idea of a stateless world, and and so yeah, thinking about that interplay is is really exciting. Okay, I see. I will pay attention to the Q and A box. I'm very sorry, everyone. Thank you for indulging my questions. Uh, Kranar Asaj uh, says first, both of these books sound, sound like they would make great gifts uh, for her mom, which is wonderful. And they, they are available soon. So just, uh, you guys can do the plugging for, <laughs> for your books. But she does, uh, she does ask now that you've written both fiction and nonfiction, um, what do you think you will want to write more of in the future? Who wants to tackle it, Jamie? Or yeah, <laughs> having microphone rubs, Jamie? Okay. I, I do find that my academic job and uh, you know the legal stuff that I do is more time like time sensitive, so I tend to spend more time on that now. But I want to spend more time on creative writing, so I do think that right now the desire is to do more creative writing, and maybe it's because of of the way that my work is structured that there's you know more um attention seeking or urgent matters that I have to attend to in my day job so it is uh, for me emotionally I want to do more creative writing and I hope to be doing more of it in the future 
um, but it is impeded by my day job and the urgent needs on my desk at, at the time. So that's how I feel right now about it. Yeah, time is the great, um, you know, it's, it's the thing that we all lack, of course. Um, as I, 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 it's, um, I don't have to do non-creative writing in my work or very not very much of it and so I do want to always put in the plug I mean I am I am a I, ha I have my doctorate and I didn't go the academic route so it is always a, a possibility for students um, to 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 think outside of academia and look for positions such as with archives if they're historians um, where you can sometimes get a little more flexibility and then have a little more time you know at 5 p.m. to devote to more creative endeavors because academic writing um, is fantastic and that research is you know, amazing and, and wonderful, but it is, it is nice to have a job where you don't have to do that so that you can then take that time and, do, and work on some more creative things. So um, that's been hugely helpful. Was that the question? What was the question? <laughs> Forgotten. I think that's sort of the question. Also, are you going to write more fiction? Do you want to talk? Oh, right. I, I'm busy trying to lure people to the archives. <laughs> Any opportunity, come work at the archives. Um, uh, yes. Yeah. No. I am. I'm in the process right now. I'm actually on a wonderful. Uh, I'm on a one year uh, leave uh, for education purposes. So much like Jamie writing in her sabbatical year. As soon as you've got a little time away from the nine to five, even if it's not an academic job, you do have a little bit more leeway. So uh, yeah, I'm working on a. I'm working on a novel right now. And it's it's one. Of, it's the third of the that trilogy you mentioned at the top. So the first two are coming out soon and then this third one um, will again be set in the archives this time in my native eastern townships and Laura's native eastern townships as well so we're back back to the back to the township um, this is great thank you so a couple more questions for you um, one from Trish uh, who also had a question about the the profession shaping your work but I think you both uh, spoken to that really eloquently but Trisha's wondering which character in your book did you love writing the best and why that's interesting question because I often think about the historical figures that we stumble upon and sometimes we like them more than others but Amy do you want to tackle that one first yeah, for for historical figures, I think it would be Marguerite Belanger, who was that sort of unknown um, that mistress, because I could I really had a lot of scope to think about what her thought process would be. And then in terms of my fictional characters, I have I have four sort of point of view protagonists who tell their story over the course of the novel. And there's one who is maybe a little different from the other. She's a grumpy. French woman, and she was my favorite because she was. I got to take out all my angst and <laughs> irritation with the world and channel it all through her. So she was my favorite to write. Well, that's fascinating. And she's got some twists and turns in her character development and being really careful about not spilling the beans. Um, and Jamie, you've got some fascinating characters in Dandelion. Did you, did you have a favorite? Yeah, I first wanted to say first that I'm, I'm going to do shameless plug, but uh, Laura said that our books are coming out, but you can pre-order both of our books at any bookstore right now. So just go online to your favorite bookstore and, <laughs> and order it. So shameless plug for both Amy and me. But um, second, I just wanted to say like as an academic and for those of you who might be academics writing, I am deliberately including my novel in my CV and, and considering it as a a piece of published work that should be considered academic. So I also don't really want to kind of limit the way that my work is talked about. It is creative writing, but I think it is definitely a product of research and it should be treated as such and, and I should get acknowledged for it at work. So that's my plug too, for those of you who want to do this in the future. I think we should all just be using this as an excuse to say, this is valid dissemination yeah. of research. Okay, having said that, my favorite characters in the book, I have two. Um, Lily's mom, Sui Hua, who, um, as I alluded to, mysteriously disappears in the book, um, and Auntie Chunyu, who Amy um, said was a little bit sassy. She, it was fun to write a sassy character also because, you know, I think sassy women um, play very important roles in stories, but in life. Um, Sui Hua was, you know, I depicted her in the book deliberately, and I hope, you know, I don't mean to spoil anything by saying this, but she does come across as, um, you know, 
I, I try to play with that um, trope, the Asian trope of like women, Asian women being fragile or docile. Um, and I hope through the book, as you see Sui Hua develop and to understand her journey and her story that you see behind the fragility and the ornamentalization that people depict, uh, put on her and, and begin to understand that she is also very similar to Auntie Chu Nu in some ways. So I just want to put that out there for those who have yet to read the book. <laughs> Thanks, Jamie. And I'm so glad, A, that you plugged uh, your books. Thank you for doing that. Um, and please keep doing that. And also, I'm so glad that you made the point about, um, in some ways, avoiding these boxes, right? Saying, like, this is your fiction work, which I certainly have been doing as I've been imagining all the, the things that you take on. But obviously, uh, for both of you, your research, your your work, it all, it all, it all crosses, it crosses borders. It, it erases many of these sort of dividing dividing lines and I think that's such a I mean great for good on you for putting that on your CV it's exciting and it's inspiring um so I appreciate that very much okay back to the q and I will focus on the Q&A box after having encouraged uh many questions so Julia again hi Julia um who has a wonderful connection to our Carleton history department um, Julia has a question about genre and history and she says uh, that when she thinks of novels I think I'll just read the question instead of trying to translate. I think when novels invoke history or take place in the past, there's a tendency to classify them as historical fiction. And I'm curious to hear about how you think about historical fiction as a genre, if you situate your novels within that genre or whether you are falling in another literary tradition. Um, and she'd also like to hear about your literary influences as I think uh, we all would. Um, Amy, do you wanna go? <laughs> Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I, I love I love historical fiction. I don't have uh, uh, any issues with it. I just, you know, I want to get it and read it. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I enjoy it. I think it's a great way. It's a great, uh, it's a great way to access history. It's exactly, I think, what Jamie was saying. You know, she, she took all that academic research and, and qu couldn't tell the story she wanted to tell in sort of that traditional um, academic way, but could tell it creatively. And I think that's what you see again and again in historical fiction. My, um, my book isn't, I, it's not its not historical fiction because it's its mostly set in, in contemporary time. Um, so it has historical fiction elements, but isn't, wouldn't be classified, I don't think, in that genre. It's more of, I think, I, I'm still learning what all these things are, but I think it's book club fiction is what it is. So, um, and I, um, in terms of literary influences, especially for this book, um, I love uh, Kate Atkinson. I, I think she's one of my favorite authors and I love how she plots. She, she's a really intricate plotter. Um, and so that's what I was kind of aspiring to. And then on the sort of more uh, popular side of things, uh, Leanne Moriarty is also a, a big favorite. She's, she's a, she's a great author, if, you know, like you want a beach read or something. She, she's uh, fabulous because she's smart, uh, keeps you thinking, but it moves along quite quickly as well. So those would probably be a couple of my more recent literary inspirations. I'm taking note of all the authors you mentioned so that I can add to my, to my list. Jamie, do you want to tell us how you think about historical or how you think about genres and maybe um, some of your literary influences? Yeah, like Amy, I'm very new to the literary world. I was not trained in creative writing or I don't have an established foothold in the creative writing world and its lingo and the way that it categorizes stories. So I'm not um, I do also love historical fiction. I don't think my work fits into historical fiction, but it definitely has some elements of historical fiction. I did deliberately write um, the first half of the book in a small town in Canada during the 80s. And one of the reasons why I deliberately did that is because when I was growing up, I read a lot of Canadiana and Ken Lit, and a lot of it was situated in places I'd never been. And it perplexed me that I lived in a country that I could read books about my own country but could not relate to them and I think um, you know so I did want to write in that context and and in some ways I did want to kind of have my own um, memory imprinted on page of a small town in, in Canada 
at a, a particular time. Um, you know, so in that sense, I, I pay homage to historical fiction, but I don't think my book could be considered historical fiction. Um, and uh, I think there was a second part of that question that I'm totally forgetting now. We want to know who your literary oh, influences yes. are. Um, I have to say there, there are quite a bit. So, you know, for example, like Elizabeth Hay wrote a lot of Canadiana and I kept seeing a lot of like landscape and things. So, I mean, when you read my book, I, I pay homage to, to that a little bit and I really enjoyed that kind of writing. Um, but I have to say one of the, the authors that actually triggered me into actually writing um, very late to this game uh, is Kevin Kwan from Crazy Rich Asians. And I have to say that when I first read his book, um, the first, it was the first time I saw in English literature, my native tongue in, in, in the, on text. And it was mind blowing to me that I thought, oh, wow. Like, you know, for, for those of you who don't know me, I don't speak Cantonese or Mandarin. I grew up speaking a dialect called Hokkien. And, you know, there's a lot of diversity within Asian culture and Chinese culture in particular. And you know, I always felt essentialized or felt as, you know, boxed into certain kinds of Chinese identities in Canada. And so reading his book really made me think, wow, there is more to be written about here. And it ignited something in me, even though it's very like rom-com and silly. Um, you know, I, it, it definitely got me started in terms of thinking I could write something that people would read. Um, and then just to say that I really enjoy other Canlit from, can, you know, for writers that write from their own communities, like Francesca Ekoyasi and uh, Carrie Ann Leong, Lindsay Wong, um, uh, Jenny Hajin Wills, you know, just name a few. There's, I, I saw Wayne Ng as one of the participants. He has a couple books out from, you know, our communities. And so I really enjoy books that bring us into other communities and speak about the particulars of their communities. Thank you so much to both of you and to our wonderful audience members as well. That was such a wonderful conversation. And there were uh, more comments in the Q&A with uh, thanks from Stephanie Silverman and Shauna Ladman. Um, so I do wanna just, again, uh, say how much uh, I am honored that you were able to spend the, the hour with us this afternoon. It was really a treat to be able to hear not only you read from your works, but also talk about your influences, what you might work on in the future uh, and of course all the hard work and, and research all that important research that went into uh, these two books so congratulations on the honeybee emeralds amy and congratulations on dandelion jamie um, we do look forward to pre-ordering or seeing them in a local bookstore uh, soon and so again thank you to everyone for joining um, take care everyone and hopefully we'll see you soon for another conversations in history bye thank you laura Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you, Amy.